behavior and hyperactivity that is uh, psychosis like behavior are produced and these uh, behaviors do not occur if along with dieting food restriction they are given uh, tryptophan doses moderate to mild doses so uh, and this is related with the deficiency of serotonin and its uh, uh, replenishment in presence of uh, tryptophan so we we suggested here that uh, while we, somebody is do, doing excessive dieting then uh, tryptophan supplementation can reduce body body weight without uh, exposing to the risk of depression or anxiety here we have so uh, this paper actually an article which shows that how glucocorticoids stress induced increases of glucocorticoids can uh, produce changes in serotonin 1a receptors which are auto receptors to predispose to depression ssris are uh, to date the um, are currently in fact the first line drugs for treating the depression and they actually act by binding to these uh, high affinity reuptake sites uh, by and therefore the increasing the concentration of of uh, tryptophan of uh, serotonin in the synapse but uh, uh, what happens when there is deficiency of tryptophan the the stores of uh, serotonin are, are depleted in that condition ssris are not able to work because Uh, the stores of serotonin are depleted and there will be no in less 5 5ht or serotonin available in the synaptic cleft so in in this condition when 5 tryptophan is administered in this condition when tryptophan is administered it can increase uh, for synthesis of serotonin in this in these stores and more of the serotonin will be available the life of the serotonin in the synapse will increase to produce antidepressant effect so uh, actually if, if there is a deficiency of tryptophan uh, the um, uh, evidence suggests it can also decrease the synthesis of pancreatic pen, uh, synthesis of serotonin in the pancreatic beta cell and in fact nowadays diabetes is also considered as a uh, as a disease um, which is precipitated because of the stress so in this um, recent article published in nutritional reviews i have shown that uh, how uh, this thing happens in a deficiency of tryptophan how it can produce diabetes this is a pan uh, pancreatic beta cell serotonin is synthesized intracellularly in the pancreatic beta cell uh, by tryptophan tryptophan is converted into 5ht and then is it's a stored with insulin in the vesicles and the serolination of uh, insulin it causes release of insulin when there is less serotonin synthesized because of the deficiency of tryptophan the enzyme is unsaturated so th there will be decrease in the formation of 5ht less 5ht will be here to release insulin and uh, insulin resistance or diabetes is produced so our suggestion here uh, in this paper is that stress induced decreases in circulating tryptophan are likely to occur because of tryptophan because tryptophan's accelerated degradation via the hepatic carnitine pathway although a depletion in circulating tryptophan is less likely to occur in the uh, adequately fed condition excessive dieting and undernutrition can deplete circulating tryptophan levels because this essential amino acid has rel relatively low tissue storage guidelines for optimal levels of circulating tryptophan can help if, if supplements of this amino acid can improve treatment efficacy uh, in uh, depression anxiety and diabetes thank you very much 
So the session is open to questions, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question and answer session will be at the end of this uh, whole session. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Driksha. Now let's move on to our next speaker. Now let's move on to our next speaker, Paspan's very own founding president and patron of the Neuroscience Interest Group, Professor Dr. Sayyid Athar Inam. Dr. Athar Inam <laughs> is a consultant neurosurgeon and the chair of neurosurgery at the Aga Khan University. After completing his MBBS from Dow Medical College, he did his PhD in Neurosciences from Northwestern University. He later went on to complete his residency, American and Canadian Board Certification and FRCS. He has also served as a visiting professor at Dow University of Health Sciences and a senior staff surgeon at Henry Ford Hospital in the past. Now without further ado, please help me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Arthur Inam to deliver his talk, The Evolution of Human Brain, Proposed Revision of Nomenclature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. So once the inauguration session is over, it's all supposed to be very informal now, right? So it has to be informal. So you know, mixing, talking and all that thing. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to talk about, I wanted to change a little, uh, little bit to something different. But then I realized that somebody else is talking about brain evolution also. And that's a woman or nasal uh, uh, evolution of a uh, woman nasal system in the, uh, in the mammalian. So, uh, so I, I just wanted to uh, switch gears and talk about the evolution of this wonderful organ that Professor Tahar Rahman talked about. So, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Can we, can we change the uh, uh, aspect ratio? Is that possible? Thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> why do I say that? All those who are medical students over here, they realize that the recurrent laryngeal nerve comes from here, goes down, and then comes up. Right? Why? It has to go from here to there. Right? And the bichara giraffe, its recurrent laryngeal nerve goes from to, uh, from. Doctor Darshan said he was saying. Doesn't come to his eyes. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve of a giraffe. Uh, and then that's that's fine. That's fine. Uh, this one will be complete. So so if you look at this one. That's okay. Huh? Sir, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So if you look at the recurrent laryngeal nerve, goes down and then comes up. You know, che meter. So <laughs> three things, right? So, so that's the that's the that is what uh, we we can explain all that based on evolution that that we see in here, right? Girls and all that stuff. Anyway, so. If you look at the, evol the evolutionary history, uh, and if you put it in a year, it's a long, long time. So if the Earth was born about 4 billion years ago, and that's the first day of uh, the year, January 1st, so look at the life came up in, Feb in, about, in uh, Febr uh, February, and really the uh, multicellular organisms came in August, and in December, there was activity in December amphibians, reptiles, mammals and all that and what not. And the last day of December 31st is when the hominids start to walk. And in the last hour of December uh, uh, 31st was when uh, the, uh, actually these things happened. And in the last minute of this year was when actually all these things that you know by history occurred. So that's the, that's the length of evolution. Remember that. So. <coughs> So what happened is that when, the, when life started with liposomes and things like that, uh, we started to have bacteria that's uh, prokaryotes and then the prokaryotes eventually symbiosis kezariye and this uh, lady, Lynn Margolis, she was wife of uh, Carl Sagan. So, uh, so the symbiosis created mitochondria and the chloroplasts and from there the eukaryotes started. From the eukaryotes for about a billion and a half years, for about a billion and a half years, the earth was a lonely place. There was nothing but bacteria and stromatolites. These are cyanobacteria. Billion and a half years, imagine, long time, right? Over about half a billion years ago, when the Cambrian explosion occurred, and that's when all the different life forms started to come in. And you know, that's when the metazoans, the invertebrates, all the phyla that you talk about now, those phyla evolved in the Cambrian era. 
So when that happened, uh, these are the pictures from my book that I'm uh, still writing, haven't finished. Uh, and you know, it's the book is on the story of evolution of human brain. Should come out in a few few months, inshallah. So, so from from uh, what what we see is that uh, from that from this lower archaea and bacteria started the protists and animals, and in the animals, the vertebrates and the vertebr invertebrate chordates, those are the ones. Rest of them, all these phyla that we see over there, these phyla did have or do have a nervous system, but then there's a basic difference. If you look at the basic difference of protostosome and deuterostosome. That the way the, the cells divide and the way the mouth forms first in them and the anus forms first in us, uh, you know, we, we, we develop mouth later, that creates the difference of our nervous system. And what we see is that, <coughs> that in a nerve net system, jellyfish and hydra and all that thing, you see this is just a nerve net. In the, in the deuterostomes, insects, uh, mollusks and all that thing, their nervous system is positioned differently, whereas the vertebrates, the corded vertebrates, their nervous system is positioned differently. My brain, my spinal cord goes in the back, my gut goes in the front, right? So that switch happened because we don't know exactly, we don't exactly know, but that was because of the division of the cells at the embryological level. Among the, uh, these uh, uh, vertebrates, then you have these lower vertebrates, fishes, they everted out the brain and the telochoroida is on the top, whereas in the human brain and rest of the vertebrates, the telochoroida comes in the center. So, <clears throat> if you look at the animals, the metazoans, there are some animals like Dixonian, like sponges, they don't have a nervous system, no neurons. The nervous system really started to evolve and it has probably evolved twice or thrice in the, his in the evolutionary history. Jellyfish has this nerve net, the hydra, this one has a nerve net, right? So it does not have a central nervous system, but it has a nerve net. And that nerve net, there's just two layers, outside, inside, and the two layers in between are the neurons that do all the work and the, the animal lives. Whereas when we go a little higher, so what we see is here is that uh, the, uh, something like, uh, um, like um, um, not E. coli. Um. Yeah, I'm scared. C. elegans. Synorabditis elegans, thank you. C. elegans, uh, and that's a picture of a C. elegans that I took myself. And that, that's, a, that's a lab of Andy Fire. He's a Nobel laureate in Stanford. My son is a student over there. So anyway, so C. elegans has about 302 neurons only. The problem is people call this C. elegans, this nervous system, this head ganglia, they call it a brain. That's the problem. So now I'm reducing the problem to you. That's why this whole talk is all about. They call this a brain. This is not a brain. This is just a head ganglion. Okay, look at the annelids, earthworm for example. They have this whole set of ganglia in each segment. This, the head ganglia, the central ganglia, they're calling it a brain, right? Uh, octopus, it has ganglia in the arms and the number of neurons in the ganglia in the, its arms are actually more than the number of ganglia in its head, head uh, um, uh, main ganglia, but they're calling it a brain. And same thing, like for example, Aplesia, just pay, Eric Kandel got a Nobel Prize for researching on memory. And then, you know, the, the uh, squid, uh, the Hux, uh, Hodgkin, Hodgkin and Huxley model of axons and all that thing, they all call it a brain. The problem is that these are all nervous collections. So neuronal collections can't be called a brain just because they are there, right? If you look at it uh, in, a, in, a, in a dorsal fila fly, and this is a typical picture of all the insect brains, they have a mixture of mushroom bodies and central uh, protocerebrum and deuterocerebrum and things like that. So that should not confuse. The neuronal structure is slightly different. So this is a typical mammalian neuron. This is a typical insect neuron. Notice that the insect neuron has an axon and a dendrite coming out from the same branch, whereas we don't have that. Our neuronal structure is different. And not only that, <coughs> there is slightly different in the action potentials and all that thing. But by the way, action potentials occur in plants also and action potentials occur in paramecium also. The, the basic thing of action potential, the potassium channels, they are present in bacteria. So you can see that you know, if the, from the bacteria up to the vertebrates, the evolution of the, uh, the potassium channels has not changed a whole lot except that they have added more, uh, 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 more uh, transmembrane chains. Achha, so, so there's a lot of similarity though. Our body is made in segments, right? This is a centipede that I caught in my bedroom. 
So I saved it. It is still saved in my library. And this is a spine model of not my patient. It's a model. So it uh, <coughs> can't be that, right? But if you look at the human body, and all of you guys know that, there are, that we have these dermatomes, right? So we're all segmented. If you look at the spine, the nerves, they're all segmented. So same thing applies to the brain as it's developing their segmentations in the brain. It's just that the certain segments of our brain, they grew up to make, uh, to make different structures that we call cerebrum and things like that. And of course, the Hoxteins and all those are behind that. I'm going to skip that one. OK. So <clears throat> if you look at the way the, uh, the nervous system developed, in a fruit fly, it goes inside from the epidermis, and it does not make a hollow tube. In, in insects, it again takes the membrane, specimen membrane by itself. But in a vertebrate, it goes down from the epidermis and makes a hollow tube. That neural tube structure is very important. So that neural tube, this is the basis of the formation of brain in all vertebrates. Uh, and no other, other thing. Uh, the 10 minutes are over. I was expecting that, sir. <laughs> so so, so that, that structure is present in all vertebrates and is not present in any other uh, animal, in any other clade. Even the amphioxus, they are little, little tiny fishes, which are just chordates present in the sand. They have a structure because they have a notochord. The neural tube is formed. And their neural tube, whether it's them, whether it's a hagfish or a lamprey or a mouse or a human being, they have the same structure. They have cerebrum, they have hypothalamus, they have medial geniculate eminence, they have diencephalon, they have midbrain. All of them have the same structures. So that's what we have to remember. So when we talk about brain, whether you know it's lamprey or a shark or, or whatever, they all came together. They all have the same structure inside. If you look at it over here, the striatum and the pallium, they are arranged in the same way with slight, slight differences. Uh, same applies to the brain stem, all these uh, vertebrates. If you look at the brain stem, they look pretty much similar, the way the nuclei are arranged and all, whether it's a frog or a salamander or a lizard or a chicken or a mouse. So, <clears throat> and, and then it goes on and on and on. So I'm going to skip that slide. But look at it. The circuitry in the pallium of a bird brain, which is so different, and bird brain, by the way, are more, in, are each gram of bird brain is more intelligent than you guys. I'm sorry to say that. But that's a fact. The neurons are small. They're densely packed. You take a gram of bird brain, and if you can harness power in that one, that is more intelligent than our brain. The circuitry of a micro column of a human brain is not too different from the circuitry of a bird brain. They don't have micro columns like we have. So there's a lot of similarity in our brains. So in conclusion, what I'm saying, and this is what Shahir is here. Shahir, are you there? Shahir, we're going to write a paper, right? Pathway, you know. So <clears throat> what I'm saying that the brain should only be called anything that develops at the tip of the neural tube, that's a brain. Everything else is just a central nervous system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Carrying on with the session, our next speaker is the principal of Dow International Medical College, Professor Dr. Zeba Haq. Dr. Zeba is the Director of Institute of Biomedical Sciences and a Professor of Biochemistry at Dow University of Health Sciences. She completed her MBBS degree from Sin Medical College and then her PhD from Karachi University. Without any further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Zeba onto the stage for a talk, Leptins and CNS Disorders. Uh, Chair uh, Dr. Fazil, um, Dr. Althair Inam, my uh, worthy supervisor, Dr. Darakshan Ali, I'm really happy to see you. And my uh, uh, really honored, uh, I'm really honored here to be in front of you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, well, I'm Zeva. Uh, you heard about me. I'll be talking about leptin in neurological diseases. Um, to s so the um, Leptin is a hormone that is secreted from adipose tissue. I think everybody knows that now. Well, adipose tissue is composed of two types of cells, um, the majority adipocytes and then the stromal factor which contains so many stress, uh, stem cells. Then types of adipose tissues are two types, brown and, and white. 
And um, this white adipose tissue serves as the endocrine or, uh, organ, and the brown adipose tissue serves as the therm uh, thermogenesis, thermoregulator. Adipokines, the history of adip adipokines starts from now. Uh, here I'll, I'll take a minute that all the people, they say that um, brain, um, brain tells the body what to do, and the body tells the brain what to order. So that thing, uh, that thought was going on since evolution. Dr. Arthur uh, Anam has talked about the evolution of the brain. Since evolution, man is thinking about what, what the brain does and why it does. So um, in 1995, after so many endeavors, leptin was discovered in 1994 and declared in 1995. Basically, that was thought to regulate the food intake and energy expenditure. Then the line of adipokines that talk with the brain cells started to be, div uh, to be discovered and adiponectin, uh, epilin, resistant, and you, you can see leptin was the fir first one to be dis uh, discovered as an adipokine that goes to brain and talks with it. So there was something that adipose tissue is telling brain what to do. So the neurological diseases Broadly speaking, they can be divided into functional diseases, the tumors, the um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and the inflammatory diseases, and so on and so forth. Uh, adipose brain access, recently it has been uh, documented fairly uh, clearly that leptin from adipose tissue goes to the hippocampal area and regulates so many uh, uh, organs there. So the leptin acts as a multifactorial hormone. Um, uh, basically, it controls the uh, food intake and energy expenditure. Later on, in 2006, it was reported that hippocampal neuroplasticity, it also regulates that. In 2007, neuro, it was declared as a neurotrophic factor. In um, 2021, uh, it was dis uh, discovered that the uh, brain responds to various environmental challenges and a leptin plays a role in that. So adipose tissue complexes, uh, complex is complexities and dyslipidemia, the leptin and adiponectin have been shown to enhance synaptic plasticity. So again, this adipose tissue has something very important to do with the brain functions. Um, in 2013, uh, we um, uh, 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 conducted a study under our Dr. Darakshan Halim uh, supervision, and we reported that inhibiting uh, the exogenous leptin can reduce stress perception. We conducted a study and we found out that the leptin levels uh, of the women who perceive stress is much more perceived as a stress perception is something different from actually being in stress. So the people who stress, perceive stress more, they have more leptin and more leptin relates with leptin resistance and its lower activity. So exogenous leptin can reduce stress perception and inhibiting stress effects. Uh, the activity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and behavior. Uh, in 2019, it was reported that uh, the pre-treatment BDNF uh, leptin ratio was significantly higher in treatment responders than in non-responders in major depressive disorder. So in MDD, leptin ratio is more, leptin levels are more and BDNF leptin levels are more and this relates to the treatment response. So considering this uh, study and the functional uh, problems in brain, uh, right now a study, a study is still going on and one of my MPhil students, Dr. Sarta, is conducting this study on the leptin BDNF ratio in epileptic patients in diagnostic field sciences. And newly diagnosed cases of epilepsies are identified. We have our treatment naive patients and eight gender PMI controlled match controls were also identified to check this uh, levels. So we found out that leptin levels in cases are much more than the control and BDNF 
is much more than con controls. Leptin levels were much more because it was thought, it was, um, uh, uh, the leptin levels, when they are increased, it result in, into the leptin resistance and re decrease in its functional activity. BDNF and leptin, both are neurotrophic factors, so both are increased in epileptic lesions. Strikingly, now look at this, leptin and BDNF are much more, significantly more in cases compared to controls, but the leptin-BDNF ratio was not that significantly different. But still, you can recognize that the values of the leptin -BD uh, BDNF leptin ratio in cases was much more. So it relates, it mimics the study with MDD that uh, they found that the pretreatment BDNF leptin ratio was more, much more and they were uh, uh, treatment responsive. So this study is still going on and the results are much awaited. These results are not published right now. So um, the highlights of my talk is the increased uh, neuronal discharge in epileptic patients is um, reflected in the increases in plasma levels of both leptin and BDNF. The ratio of BDNF and leptin levels is not significantly different, but actual levels are much more. And both neurotrophic factors are increased in response to neural damage due to the seizures. So um, the point, the thinking uh, point is, at multiple times in Quran, it says that, um, Eat of good things, uh, and we have provided for you. Uh, in chapter number two, in chapter num uh, in so many verses it is written. So uh, maybe because um, oh, so adipocytes, uh, gut brain axis. Maybe it's the thing. And at multiple times, it is also instructed to follow the five times prayer timings and wake up and uh, sleep cycle. So it raises it. It relates to the circadian rhythm of the hormones. So the hormones, if they are secreted much, uh, uh, regularly, uh, they are regulated tightly, they can tell the brain to be the normal one. You know? So this is the thing. Um, so the future prospects is the food and nutrition is the cue, key to the healthy body and brain. Brain instructs the body what to do, and the body uh, tells the brain what to order. And the link to be discovered is the adipokines. There's much more to be discovered, right? And microbiome relates to the brain health. And yet to be discovered, there are so many other things that are left to you, my students, to discover. And lifestyle affects the body and brain health more than it is thought. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zeba. Our next speaker for this session is Professor Dr. Noor Jahan. Dr. Noor Jahan is a professor of pharmacology at the Dow University of Health Sciences, along with being the Dean of Faculty of Pharmacology at said university. I would kindly request Dr. Noor Jahan to please come to the stage for a talk titled The Effect of Antidepressant as a Juvent Therapy with an Antiarthritic Agent in Rat Model. Assalamualaikum. First of all, I would like to say um, thanks uh, to all organizing committee, especially Dr. Sonia, that uh, she gave me a chance to be here to share uh, some of my research here. Um, so the, the title of my talk is uh, Effect of Antidepressants as Adjuvant Therapy with an Anti-Arthritic Agent and that was conducted in RAT model. So we have certain uh, medications for the treatment of depression and uh, you all know what is the depression um, uh, talk is conducted already here and uh, very senior professors are here, Dr. Daraksha is here, Dr. Um, uh, Inam Sahab is here and other Dr. Fazal and all these. So a number of um, great, uh, I would say that scientists and uh, researchers are there who have talked uh, much about that. So we all know depression, so there is um, basically deficiency of uh, as medicine said tryptophan basically and then the serotonin leading to that 
uh, depression and anti depressants are available in the market and those anti depressants most commonly are tricyclics ssris snris as well as uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors and some of the newer agents are there now i relate that with uh, arthritis and uh, you know that arthritis is basically the joint uh, pain inflammation of joints and it is uh, soiling and tenderness of some of the or more of the joints and uh, the main symptoms of arthritis are basically the pain and stiffness and that typically worsen with the age medications for the arthritis are also available in the market and uh, some of the medications are analgesics obviously the pain is one of the major symptom non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs to overcome the symptoms corticosteroids and uh, disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs these are the demards some of the biologics are also available um, targeted dnas are here uh, which are uh, basically some of the carriers inhibitors as well as some of the uh, phosphodiesterase uh, four inhibitors also available some of the inflammation related disorders are here as we are talking about here uh, with the arthritis so inflammation is one of the major cause that can lead to a number of disorders and these may include the obesity heart diseases some of the type the one as well as the type 2 diabetes inflammatory bowel disease celiac disease asthma could be there many types of cancers also may be due to the start with the inflammation and certain other uh, disorders are there autism is there asthma is there alzheimers is there uh, sometimes parkinson that are due to the initiation of inflammation first and then it can progress to certain other leading disorders anti arthritic medications and depression so many of the anti arthritic medications are responsible to cause depression and uh, some of the dr uh, drugs like uh, here the aprimilast is there as a thioprine cyclosporine as well as leflunamide methotrexate and some others are there so the study the current study conducted on some of the uh, leflunamide and its derivatives those were actually the metal complexes the drug leflunamide is one of the anti arthritic medication that was uh, chosen as it was uh, found that it is inducing some type of depression but less as compared to the other anti rheumatic drugs anti arthritic drugs so the our study in our study we uh, conducted uh, this study on the rat models and then uh, we uh, found uh, the elevation or suppression of certain indolamines in the brains and uh, the methodology was that first of all induction of uh, arthritis was there by utilizing um, uh, that was uh, adjuvant and uh, that adjuvant was administered in the red paw 0.1 ml with the paraffin and uh, the study was conducted for 24 days after administration of that uh, arthritis uh the um, readings were observed like macroscopic changes those were uh, inflammatory changes in the paw and were uh, scored from 0 to um, mean 0 no inflammation or um, arthritic changes uh, one means some inflammation is started in one finger two inflammation is started in two fingers three inflammation is started in the whole paw so the study was conducted in this way in the end the weight of the animals were um, found after 24 um, uh, days and it was found that uh, with the administration of uh, leflunamide as well as its metal complexes uh, the body weights were somewhat uh, same but when we added uh, one of the uh, antidepressant drug that was floxetine it was found that body weights were going to be reduced and the reason was that the levels of serotonin were raised somewhat which, which were responsible to um, treat the depression but these were responsible to decrease the body weight as uh, serotonin is one of the natural appetite suppressant also poor edema readings were observed there and uh, we found that uh, uh, with the leflunamide as well as metal complexes the poor edema was going to be reduced but when we administered floxetine with that along with that drug we found that there was no significant decrease in uh, the levels of uh, um you can say the um, activity or the arthritic changes or inflammation changes levels of tnf alpha were measured noted and this was in relation to inflammation whenever the tnf alpha levels you know that it is going to be reduced we says that some of the inflammation is going to be reduced so again derivatives were responsible to decrease the tnf alpha levels as well as 
uh, ROS levels in the samples, uh, which were uh, uh, basically the PAW homogenate samples. The PAWs of the rats were homogenized, and then the, they were run for the TNF alpha as well as the ROS levels. Then the brains of the animals were isolated, and the uh, activity was conducted by uh, performing uh, reverse phase HPLC. And the levels of tryptophan as well as uh, serotonin as well as um, indole hydroxy acetic acid, IHAA, were conducted on that. And the results are the control readings as well as with the administration of leflunomide as well as with the administration of metal complexes of leflunomide. The readings are here. And uh, when the combination of uh, phloxetine was administered, we found that the levels of tryptophan are going to be elevated or raised. As in the uh, start, uh, we were um, uh, taking one of the talk of Dr. Daraksha, and she said that if there are no stores of tryptophan, so the synthesis of serotonin will not be there, and then the SSRIs will not be effective. But here, the SSRIs are going to be effective. It means these are the normal elements having normal levels of serotonin. Brain indolamine levels were determined, and these are the, the graph that is showing the brain indolamine levels of uh, uh, leflunomide as, as well as its metal complexes. The next diagram is showing the effect of leflunomide with fluoxetine, and the levels of serotonin are going to be much more raised. You can see that the readings are going to touch thousands, um, means uh, the range on uh, nanogram per gram. Brain indolamine levels, these are uh, without phloxetine, as well as the brain indolamine levels, these are along with the administration of phloxetine. So I will go to the conclusion. So in the start, we have three major questions. The first one was, either the leflumide as well as metal complexes are responsible to cause the depression. So we found yes. Secondly, either the administration of any of the antidepressant, like here we choose phloxetine, would be effective. Uh, for treating the depression along with the arthritis induced animals so we found yes the third question we found that either if you are going to make a combination of anti-arthritic medication like leflunomide or some of its derivatives with the fluoxetine either it will have some effect on arthritis also it will reduce the activity in case of arthritis so we found no it means we can have a combination that can give a better effect for the treating of both depression as well as its treated, uh, related depression. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Noor Jahan. Our last speaker for this session, but not least, is the principal of Dow College of Pharmacy, Professor Dr. Sumbal Shamim. Dr. Sumbal Shamim is a professor of pharmacology and a member of Board of Studies, Board of Faculty, Syndicate, and Senate of Dow University of Health Sciences. He is also chairperson of Department of Pharmacology and former dean of Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Dow College of Pharmacy. I would now like to invite Dr. Sumber to the stage so that she may deliver her talk, Nanomedicine in Central Nervous System Disorders. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, honorable guest, the chairperson, Dr. Sonia and all the worthy speakers who have presented already. This, uh, the topic that I have selected is actually for our junior researchers to give them a fruit of forethought that how we can proceed if we have to adopt to work on the nanomedicines. So particularly for the CNS disorders. In central nervous system disorders, Presently, what is going on and what are the future perspectives? So, the objectives of discussion to give an overview about the application of nanotechnology in the diagnosis, in the treatment of brain disease and disorders, and further to illuminate the potential of nanoparticles so that the researchers could find the aspects to work on them further. As you can see, that, uh, how the brain disease and disorders are uh, having the most notable features 
to be determined as they are going to deteriorate the cognitive function, the motor function, the behavioral functions and they are resulting in the form of impairment of the neurological activities. The blood brain barriers, we have all of them are aware, all of you are aware that they are actually uh, the um, vessels that are separating the brain from the blood circulation. There are about, you know, 100 billion of neurons in the human brain, but capillaries in the brain may be as small as 7 to 10 micrometer in the diameter. So that's why the, the blood brain barrier lacks the, intel, the intracellular and valvular grafts that the entry pathway from the environment to the brain is very, very, very limited. If we uh, say about the overall application of the nanoparticles, not only in the therapeutics, but also in the diagnostics, in the medical imaging, in preparation of vaccines, and also for the regenerative medicines in the form of biomaterials. These nanoparticles, whenever we say about the uh, brain, refers to the smallest particles usually within the size range of 0.1 to 100 nanometers. They are formed from the natural or from the artificial manipulation of the compounds or with the metals. They may be organic, inorganic and innovative nanoscale targeted techniques are adopted to prepare these nanoparticles. They are delivered as active agents with promising pharmacokinetic to improve these disorders that we have discussed previously. And whole brain imaging, one of the diagnostic methods for CT, PET, MRI, and paramagnetic nanomaterials, in particularly iron oxide nanoparticles, they have replaced almost the standard gadolinium based approaches because these nanoparticles of iron oxide have been found to be more, um, more helpful for the diagnosis as compared to the, golden and the gadolinium particles. Both are the metals although, but these nanoparticles have replaced the previous one. We see the, if we see the main pathways for uh, the nanoparticles, they have to cross the blood-brain barriers. This, this main pathway is showing that for preparing the nanoparticle to cross the blood-brain barrier, the therapeutic ligands has to be incorporated into the nanoparticles and with the active transport ligand. In this way, the um, transporter is prepared, enabling this active transport across the blood-brain barrier. So this integrated form or conjugated form of nanoparticles with therapeutic agent and active transport ligand helps to provide the transportation through the uh, the, the blood vessels in the brain. Whenever these particles are prepared, these can be transported inside the blood brain barrier by different ways. Number one, as paracellular pathway, as transcellular, as transcytosis, and as the receptor mediated endocytosis. As you can see in the last fourth step, receptor mediated endocytosis can be seen with the help of these type of nanoparticles. So these nanoparticles are enhancing to make the strategies to make the drug delivery possible towards the brain. They cross the blood-brain barrier uh, without functionalization, receptor mediated, as we have seen, transcytosis uh, and adsorption mediated transcytosis and the making the exploitation of um, macrophages and uh, all the monocytes infiltration into the CNS and they are going to cross the blood brain barrier disrupting the th uh, the, uh, these blood brain barriers and uh, in this way this transcyptic synaptic retrogression transportation is also possible with the help of these new strategies of new nanoparticles. So far different kinds of nanoparticles we have to focus on this slide that what are the types of nanoparticles that can be prepared in the lab even by the researchers. Metal, metal oxides like this, liposomes, polymeric uh, nanoparticles, uh, fuel inners. Fuel inners are the actually 
uh, high carbon bond containing uh, nanoparticles, solid lipid nanoparticles, the polylactate co-glycoside nanoparticles in this form, then metal nanoparticles and also the magnetic, nano, the magnetic nanoparticles that are very important for the diagnostic purpose also. So in this way, what are the uh, important features that should be present in a nano, nano, nanoparticle that will be considered as a successful nanoparticle to penetrate it into the CNS? So first of all, they should be biodegradable, non-toxic and biocompatible. Secondly, their physical properties should easily be manipulated according to the mode of delivery. You can see here that the special properties can be induced in these nanoparticles so that our required targeted cells in the brain can be easily detected and treated. Modified chemical properties should be achieved organ to or cell specific drug delivery can be made possible with the help of these. So last but not the least the cost effectiveness. This is very important parameter. The cost effectiveness being that a medical professionalist and pharmacologist is the one of the aspects that is usually ignored. So in this way, if nanoparticles are joined with the drug molecules, the advantage we have in the green color that high efficiency, high solubility, high specificity, biodegradability, and with the advantage of having low aspect, low aspects and of side effects, toxicities, drug resistance. So in this way, the most, one of the most important thing about the brain cancer is the nanotechnology, how we are uh, going to take this technology for the transfer of <coughs> anti-cancer agent through Dr. the breast Sumbul, I would request you to kindly finish it as soon as possible. Okay, Thank you, sir. May I you? So the nanoparticles should be have particular characteristic uh, that should be able to reach the tumor, depending upon the tumor particular characteristics, stage and location, whether what is the stage of that tumor and where it is located. So in this way the designing should be like that, like that, that cancer therapy uh, that is the uh, nano carrier and active agent should be present to detect the location and to treat as well. So size and number of hydrogen bonds are very important in that particular uh, liposome that will be able to prevent any type of um, hindrance across the blood brain barrier. So potential drug like uh, gold nanoparticles, they are also important inter internasal delivery of heparinized A. Hyper uh, heparin A is actually the compound that was used uh, for the treatment of uh, Alzheimer's disease. This heparin A is actually uh, working as acetylcholine transferase inhibitors or NMDA uh, receptor blocker. In this way, the availability of this drug can be enhanced for the patient of health, particularly as diabetes diseases. And uh, for glioblastoma patients, like the drug uh, the, in the form of magnetic nan nanoparticles and uh, temozolomide can be given to enhance, the, to show the 70% improvement in the chemotherapy. So apoptosis, inflammation, oxidative stress by different uh, signaling pathways can be inhibited. Uh, Dr. Sumbul, if you could please finish this. These Thank are the you. some few examples that are uh, FDA approved drug uh, nanoparticles for the treatment of different diseases like mRNA, mRNA vaccine for COVID-19 patients, Doxil, these are the FDA approved molecules and then for schizophrenia, <coughs> then uh, lipos liposomal uh, for the lipolymphometers meningitis, then pigality interferon beta alpha 1 alpha for multiple sclerosis, and further formulations are there. These are few challenges. First of all, uh, important thing is that whenever vaccines are prepared with the help of these nanoparticles, the thing is of because of the changes in the uh, environment and temperature, aggregation of nanoparticles can occur. This is one of the important challenges that have, that have been faced by the clinicians and the patients during the era of this COVID-19. 
So one of the important thing is that it should be remembered that how to prepare these nanoparticles that can be stable and, and can, are not going to produce any type of aggregation. So the purpose of nanoparticles should be there. So these are some conclusions. They are going to be facilitated, reducing the toxicity, synergistic effect can be seen, they can diffuse easily, combination can be there to enhance the synergistic activity and good biodegradability and biocompatibility should be developed to repair. It should be kept in the mind by the researcher that how we can improve uh, the nanoparticles because each nanoparticle has some own merits and demerits also. So it may accumulate in the tissues, in the organs. So investigation should be there to prepare the proper nanoparticles. It is a fruit for thought for our new researchers. At our Docology Pharmacy, we have our own labs where we can prepare the nanoparticles with the help of pharmaceutics, pharmacology and pharmaceutical chemistry, silver nanoparticles and also the gold nanoparticles we have prepared and the students are working uh, in the MPhil uh, research for their efficacy in different type of conditions like arthritis and inflammatory disorders. Thank you so much. Uh, firstly, I am very thankful to all the speakers who have spoken today. Um, I apologize for interrupting your talks uh, because of the duration uh, that we had for this session. But we are very grateful. I would advise all the students and uh, the members of uh, PASMAN who might have any questions for the uh, speakers today to approach them directly and uh, ask them. Uh, but with this, I would like to end this session. Thank you. I would like to request the audience to please make their way to the first floor biochemistry lab where lunch is being served. Thank you. Students? Okay. Students will be served uh, food boxes outside the lecture hall.